Good morning and good evening, everyone from Tokyo, Japan. Thanks for joining us for the Atlantis webinar with MIT professor Julie today. And I'm Tomoyuki Akiyama from Preferred Networks, and I'll be your MC today. Um, before we move on to the next section, um, let's let me explain how the Q&A works in this webinar. Um, using the Q&A button on your screen, um, you can send written questions to us. And we will later select uh, the most common questions, and the presenters will answer them um, after the, the webinar, the, the lecture. And your questions will only be visible to the host, uh, us, hosts to the uh, at first, but um, your questions will be shared with the rest of the participants if they're selected. And I'd also like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be shared later. Um, first of all, we have some uh, opening remarks from uh, Daisuke Okanohara, CEO of Preferred Computational Chemistry, uh, the company that provides our atomistic simulator, Matlantis, for material discovery. Uh, good morning, Daisuke. Are you on the line? Hi. Uh, good morning. Okay, I can hear you very well. So please go ahead and start your um, opening remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Daisuke Okanohara, uh, CEO of the Preferred uh, Computational Chemistry, or PFCC. Uh, thank you for joining today, especially all of you in the United States who are observing Memorial Day. As some of you may know, the technology that Professor Lee is about to present today is accessible accessible through our universal atomistic simulator called Matlantis. It's a cloud-based service you can use on your web browser, and it can simulate atomistic behavior of any new materials up to uh, 20 million times faster than the conventional DFT methods. It's also a highly universal and versatile. It currently supports combination of 72 elements. You will see why that's possible in uh, today's Professor Lee's uh, presentation shortly. We first launched Matlantis in uh, 2021 in Japan, and it's currently helping over uh, 50 companies and research organizations in Japan. We just launched Matlantis in the United States last month, and multiple clients in the United States including uh, Professor Lee's teams at MIT are uh, using it on a trial basis or under paid, paid plans. I hope today's lecture will help you understand what's happening and what will happen soon at the forefront of material science. So hello, Professor Lee, are you ready to present? Yes, I am. So uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, so, uh, could you, are you ready? Could you start? Do you see the slides? Yes. Great. Okay. It's a great pleasure to uh, talk to the audience uh, today. Uh, and uh, we all know that uh, the invention of the uh, universal gravitational force law enabled Newton to solve for uh, celestial bodies. And uh, Newtonian mechanics really covers uh, up to galaxies and down to atoms. So by solving the equation of motion with uh, interatomic potentials between atoms, uh, we can uh, understand material properties. Uh, now, today I would like to talk to you about empirical uh, interatomic potential as versus uh, ab initial calculations. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1998 was awarded to uh, Professor Walter Kohn and Professor John Popo uh, for their development of uh, density functional theory and quantum chemical methods. So there, uh, when you are given uh, n uh, atomic uh, positions at the position of the nuclei, when solved for the electronic structure, uh, quantum mechanical problem on the fly, uh, and then uh, in order to obtain uh, this uh, potential, uh, and then the uh, first derivative of the potential 
for the positions give you the uh, forces. However, uh, these ab initial methods are very expensive. Uh, for example, uh, even with uh, density functional theory, uh, we typically treat uh, you know, usually uh, less than a few hundred atoms. And the time scale that we can cover are usually on the order of nanoseconds. And that forbids uh, the simulation of complex defects, for example, curved dislocations, curved green boundaries, uh, heterogeneous nucleation, uh, solid liquid interfaces, et cetera. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, uh, most of the uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, to understand materials defects and the microstructure evolution were performed using uh, empirical interatomic potentials. So what you see here is a dislocation being absorbed into the uh, twin boundary of face center cubic copper. And the sort of uh, canonical code to, to do that kind of simulation is LAMPS. And coupled with LAMPS, we have uh, this uh, open uh, KM, for example, project where you can use uh, empirical interatomic potentials. And there is a very nice project that uh, hosts uh, all the uh, open source uh, uh, empirical potentials. However, uh, we know that most of the potentials so far are for chemically simple systems. Uh, that is, uh, usually they are, for example, pure silicon or uh, pure copper. Um, uh, and there are also quite a number of binary uh, potentials and uh, up to uh, four or five elements, but uh, there was no universal potential that can cover the whole periodic table. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today is the development of uh, this uh, universal new network uh, in harmonic potential, which uh, avoids solving the electronic structure problem, but give you a uh, DFT level computational efficiency. So uh, the first paper on the new network potential uh, started with Baylor and Paranello, who developed a two layer uh, fully connected uh, new network based on so-called symmetry functions. Uh, in other words, uh, for, each in, uh, for each atom uh, and its uh, uh, neighbors, uh, you first compute uh, a number of uh, uh, distance and angle dependent uh, symmetry functions. So these are uh, rotational invariants. And then you feed them into these uh, two layer new networks with uh, hyperbolic tangent activation functions. And what was really amazing about that initial work was that uh, the uh, mean square error in the energy is um, about five MeV uh, milli electron volt per atom. This is really uh, amazingly good uh, compared to what we had seen before. Uh, so what you see here are for nickel, copper, uh, lithium, molybdenum, silicon, germanium. So these are the embedded atom potentials, uh, uh, many body embedded atom potentials uh, and Kursov potentials. So these are these numbers are in MeV per atom uh, for the training and the testing set. So what you see here is uh, even with MEM potential, you get uh, error on the order of 0.1 uh, electron volt per atom. And for germanium, you see how big uh, the error is. But uh, with uh, machine learning uh, interatomic potentials, and not all of these are new network potentials, by the way. So there is uh, this uh, Gaussian approximation potential, gap potential. There is the uh, moment tensor potentials. Uh, there is the uh, snap potential, spectral neighbor analysis potentials. And just look at the uh, sort of the scale of the error uh, in the uh, testing uh, sets. Uh, compared to you know, what we have uh, with this uh, uh, famous empirical potentials. So you get really one or two orders of magnitude uh, improvement uh, by turning to machine learning potentials. And there is a very nice review uh, by Ong et al, uh, which uh, plots the, uh, this uh, precision of the uh, potential. And by the way, these are compared to uh, DFT calculations. Uh, because they uh, generate uh, configurations and, and we are comparing not to experiment, but to uh, DFT calculations versus the computational time uh, or cost of, of using these potentials. So 
for example, the gap potential uh, is quite expensive, but quite accurate. Uh, in this plot uh, for these uh, simple metals and semiconductors, uh, the new network potential, uh, which are these uh, orange dots, are, are not necessarily uh, uh, you know, the, the most accurate or the, or the most efficient. Uh, actually, the more efficient ones are these uh, moment tensor potentials. Uh, but you certainly have a trade-off between uh, the, uh, the precision and the computational cost. Uh, however, what, what we noted in uh, this uh, overview is that uh, all these are very simple uh, systems and these different potentials are not uh, easily connected together. In other words, you, you cannot pick a potential for, gem, uh, for germanium and, and let it you know, play with copper and, and expect you know, good results out of that. So uh, what we have done at MIT uh, thinks about 2019 uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Tim Caxerius uh, is looking at some binary and ternary uh, systems such as uh, sodium chloride, uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride systems, uh, and initially using the baylor parnello form. And we have a uh, energy error, we have a force matching error, and then we also have uh, trying to prune the new network, have a regularization of the new network weights. And in this particular example, we have used 168 uh, symmetry functions per atom that includes both the bound angle and bound length uh, dependence. Uh, we fit to uh, mostly uh, normal liquids, but also high temperature liquids, uh, highly compressed liquids, uh, gas phase dimers, uh, and crystals as well as some off stochmetric uh, uh, structures. And uh, we generate a database with VASP and uh, perform this, uh, and, and also treat the very short range interaction. There is some uh, uh, tricks you need to make sure uh, they don't collapse uh, when they're very close to each other. And uh, I, we are able to basically reproduce this kind of amazing uh, precision in uh, compared to DFT calculation. So uh, in chemistry, there is something called chemical accuracy, uh, which is the typical uh, error in making thermal chemical measurements, which is about one kcal per mole. So this is, if you measure the heat of formation, the Gibbs free energy, this is the typical error you make, and that's about 40 MeV per atom. So in other words, we are able to fit uh, to DFT really, really well. Uh, it's uh, you know, uh, a fraction of uh, the experimental error. And I just want to say that the DFT error uh, is very often uh, more than the chemical accuracy. So on average is about 2.5 times uh, 2.5 kcal per mole on the order of 100 MeV per atom. So we're able to fit DFT much better than uh, DFT can reflect reality. And uh, we can use this uh, potential to do MD simulations to get these pair distribution functions. We can get equation of state at uh, finite temperature, pretty high temperatures for molten salt. Uh, we can get density, uh, thermal conductivity, diffusivity, heat capacity. Uh, we're able to predict uh, <clears throat> crystals uh, uh, elastic constant, uh, their surface energies, uh, the uh, point defect formation energies, uh, and these uh, interfacial properties are uh, really well. And we have then uh, move on to, uh, in collaboration with uh, Stefan Lam, uh, move on to uh, lithium fluoride. So we're able to get uh, uh, good uh, forces uh, and, and good arrows. Again, really amazingly good uh, precision uh, at the surface energies, uh, comparing uh, the new network with the DFT for, uh, uh, the uh, gas phase dimers uh, for the for the for the crystal states, and then uh, we simulated this uh, ternary system. So this is uh, uh, lithium fluoride, uh, beryllium fluoride, uh, multiple crystal structures, and uh, their uh, diffusivity. And we even put hydrogen uh, in in the system and track uh, diffusion of hydrogen. So uh, we also have applied this uh, to metallurgical systems. A very famous uh, challenging problem uh, in this field is uh, 
getting a, a good potential for uh, equal titanium uh, shape memory alloys. Now the reason is uh, at zero temperature, actually uh, there is a very uh, close energy degeneracy between the B2 phase, uh, the B19 prime phase and B33 phase. And the uh, temperature induced uh, Martin Cytic phase transformation, you, you really just have uh, a few MeV per atom kind of uh, a thermodynamic driving force. So uh, what we have shown is that uh, by using uh, 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 the new network approach, uh, we really can uh, predict the thermodynamic properties. We can predict the phonon properties uh, of, of these phases uh, to very high accuracy. And so uh, to show you that, uh, the previous empirical potential uh, with uh, two nearest neighbors, uh, MEM potential, uh, was able to reproduce the endpoint of phonon instability, uh, but it was not able to capture uh, a, a second uh, phonon instability from gamma to R. Okay, so, uh, but with uh, uh, this new network potential, we're able to uh, capture both uh, phonon instabilities, which are crucial for describing the soft modes and uh, these are Martin Cetic uh, phase transformation systems. So uh, we actually uh, performed a finite temperature uh, potential mean force calculation for uh, B2. So at zero temperature, B2 is unstable. Uh, it has imaginary phonons, and then it goes to B19 and then B19 prime. But then as we raise the temperature to 300K uh, and to 350K, we're able to actually have uh, this transition uh, to the to the B2 phase. So we're able to uh, predict uh, without actually explicitly fitting uh, the uh, uh, Martin Cetic uh, phase transformation temperature often with an error uh, of, of about uh, 50 Kelvin. So I consider that uh, to be a really a, a great success uh, because uh, previously people were just not able to uh, describe all these phases uh, 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 accurately. And, and I should say that in, in this fitting, we did not uh, explicitly do the finite temperature MD simulations. Uh, we sample uh, random configurations. And one thing we're able to predict is that uh, uh, even at uh, uh, this kind of twin boundaries between uh, B2 and its uh, twin, uh, there is actually a little sliver of this B19 prime uh, metastable phase. So in other words, uh, you have this very curved, gently curved uh, twin boundary, and it's a very glissal uh, twin boundary. So that was actually observed uh, uh, later experimentally uh, in, in TM observations. And we're able to uh, use this potential to carry out uh, large scale uh, molecular dynamic simulations of, of nanowire deformation. So now I would like to turn to sort of the, the centerpiece of today's talk, because based on the previous uh, model system, new network potential development, you know, I've shown you uh, our experience with it and, and applying it to uh, realistic simulations, uh, we generally uh, appreciate the precision of the method. But what about the transferability? Uh, because we know nature is made up out of, you know, this uh, at least 92 uh, elements, and we have amazing, chemistry. So the goal that we set out at the beginning is actually pretty modest. So I actually uh, discussed with uh, So Takamoto, uh, who was uh, visiting uh, my group at MIT. The goal is really to reproduce high school chemistry, right? So if you, let's say, throw a piece of sodium chloride into water, you get uh, solvation of sodium cation and, and chlorine anion, and they're separated. If you throw a piece of metallic sodium uh, into water, you know, you're going to generate hydrogen. If you freeze the water, you know, the ice should float on top of the, the, the liquid water. So just basic, basic facts of, of our world can we reproduce uh, by a, a new network, uh, universal new network potential. Uh, just you just, just do straight MD simulation. Can you just capture those basic uh, phenomena? And so the goal of uh, this work, uh, and really we uh, submitted the work uh, really early, but uh, it wasn't really <laughs> reviewed very well. So it took a long time uh, to, to publish this work. 
Uh, but the goal is really to deal uh, the whole periodic table. Uh, it's a very ambitious goal. Uh, but uh, there are several sort of principles. Uh, one is the so-called equivariance uh, principle, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, if you're given a, a pattern, let's say you want to do uh, uh, pattern recognition with some kind of convolutional neural network. Now, if you rotate the character, it should be the same uh, character. And similarly, you know, for molecular structures, if you translate or rotate uh, the configuration, then you should preserve uh, the energy. So uh, how to ensure uh, that uh, you have equivariant uh, new network given the Cartesian coordinates of the atoms is, is one thing that uh, we need to consider. And uh, there are many uh, uh, architectures out there. For example, if you only use this, uh, uh, symmetry functions, which are rotation invariants, and obviously uh, you will be equivariant. Uh, but you could also construct, based on uh, spherical harmonics, uh, these uh, SC3 uh, equivariant uh, graph uh, new networks. <clears throat> what we have cho uh, chosen is uh, an alternative approach using tensors. Uh, vector is just a rank one tensor, but uh, you can also have rank three tensor, rank four tensor, and rank two tensor is, is a matrix. So uh, tensor is actually really simple. It, it actually is invented to guarantee uh, this equivariant. Uh, it basically says that any physical quantity T, uh, if you measure in a particular frame, uh, then for any physical quantity, you must satisfy uh, this principle that if you undergo a frame uh, rotation, uh, then in the new frame, uh, this must be related to the previous frame measurements by this uh, index contraction scheme where we're using uh, Einstein uh, index uh, summation. So this is the basic tensor transformation law. And then uh, once you have uh, tensors, uh, you just use the uh, Einstein notation so you can just do this uh, diode operation. You can get rank four tensor by concatenating two rank two tensors. Or uh, if you know you have dummy summation variables at J and K are summed over, you are left with a vector. So uh, the idea is, you know, as long as you rigorously follow uh, the tensor diode and contraction laws, uh, then you are guaranteed uh, to have uh, equivariance. So uh, what we have done uh, is, uh, so uh, so uh, was a, uh, a visiting scholar at MIT uh, uh, from uh, Professor Satoshi uh, Izumi lab at uh, University of Tokyo. And so uh, what we just do is, you know, uh, assign uh, scalars, for example, 128 scalars, 16 vectors, but also 16 tensors, uh, three by three matrices, we tag these quantities onto atoms. And then we also tag uh, these quantities to bonds. So we can also have bond-centered scalars, bond-centered vectors, uh, and, and rank two or even rank three tensors. And so we do this kind of atom to bond and then bond to atom distribution and aggregation uh, with uh, you know, nonlinear activation functions inside. And uh, you know why do we do this? Uh, so the intuition uh, really comes from so-called uh, linear combination of atomic orbitals uh, or tight binding approach in electronic structure theory. So for example, uh, if you want to calculate the electronic band structure of second carbide, then what you can do is to use 1s orbital, 3p orbital, 5d orbital, and then an, an excited s orbital. And you can you know, use these uh, atomic orbitals and you can construct an electronic Hamiltonian. Now this electronic Hamiltonian is, uh, you know, depends on the charge density, right? So, but, but you, you can see that, uh, you know, the tensor characters uh, in, in this Hamiltonian. And if you do a frame rotation, then these basis functions uh, would undergo rotations and then all these uh, overlap matrices would also transform according to the tensor transformation. So this uh, is a really uh, a very uh, important uh, step in understanding uh, the electronic structures of molecules and, and solids. 
So what we do in the tensor embedded uh, atom network or abbreviated as, as TNet is just to uh, assign these atomic and bond centered scalars, vectors, and even rank two tensors with a nonlinear interactions. Uh, and this uh, block mimics the construction of a tight binding electronic Hamiltonian uh, in the uh, local basis. And then uh, what we do is to mimic uh, iterative electronic relaxation. So for any of uh, you know, uh, people who have used the VASP, you know that the VASP, uh, they would uh, iterate to get converged charge density and also uh, converged electronic Hamiltonian to plot the band structure. So we actually uh, just concatenate uh, these layers uh, and we actually uh, did um, much deeper than the previous efforts. Uh, we have uh, 16 layers uh, in the TNet. And in the end, we just get this uh, scalar total energy. So that's the, that's the idea is each uh, block is essentially, uh, you can think of it as a tight binding Hamiltonian, but then we're doing the charge density iteration, mimicking uh, density functional theory calculation. And there is a lot of uh, architectural details in the pre-processing in how you create uh, the, 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 the scalars, the vectors and tensors and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, but sort of on, on, on the big scale of things, uh, it's actually give you a, a very interesting problem because uh, you know we always are going to be limited by uh, memory and uh, computational time resources. So we are not you know, allowed to have very uh, wide uh, layers or, or very deep layers, right? So, but let's say, uh, you know, for each bond, uh, you can allocate 256 uh, floating point numbers uh, in the GPU. Um, is it more uh, efficient to have 256 scalars, <clears throat> symmetry functions are all scalars, <clears throat> or can we afford to have 30 vectors that is packed to the particular bond, let's say between germanium and silicon, that particular silicon germanium bond, or are we going to assign 115 scalars to that particular bond, 20 vectors, six three by three matrix to that bond, right? That, that, you know, that could have a, you know, electronic Hamiltonian, that's a, that's a matrix, or you know, you could even argue you can think about flexoelectric or piezoelectric properties per bond. So we have these tensors, which are you know rank three tensors, right? So uh, how are we going to construct architecture so that uh, we have the most efficient, uh, easy to do training and representation for bond packed quantity? So that's something that. Uh, 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 is, 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 is sort of at the, at the soul of, 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 this, of this architecture. And just to show you, uh, you know, the, uh, what we have uh, obtained uh, in this uh, first paper uh, with uh, Universal Tokyo. So uh, <clears throat> this is a comparison of uh, settling, uh, ethane, uh, ethane, benzene, cyclohexane, uh, <clears throat> and uh, metals, uh, sodium, aluminum, silicon, uh, and then different polymorphs of uh, silica. So quartz, uh, cristobolite, uh, tritomite, uh, and amorphous uh, silica. This is uh, liquid water, but with a hydronium cation and a chloride anion. So this is hydrochloric acid in water. And the key is that we're able to do this all with the same potential. So we're able to demonstrate the first 18 elements of the periodic table from hydrogen to argon. And this actually shows you the entire fitting database. So these are all generated uh, DFT database that we use to fit uh, this TNet. And we are just having random interactions. We're basically randomly throwing atoms into our fitting supercell and so, for example, you have carbon chlorine uh, bonds, and, and you know you have 622 possible uh, configurations that you know that 
we have generated in, 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 in sampling the chemistry. So the fact that we're populating the entire, uh, you know, 18 by 18 uh, pair bond matrix just shows you that we really sample very diverse chemistries in the fitting database, but we're able to demonstrate uh, excellent uh, fitting error. So uh, the big story is that uh, after So uh, went back to Japan, he joined the leading uh, AI company, uh, Preferred uh, Networks, and uh, he uh, basically uh, formed a, a big team uh, and uh, they're able to take uh, the TNet architecture, did a lot of proprietary uh, innovations on that architecture uh, to make the uh, potential very high performance and also uh, uh, preferred uh, computational chemistry a company have uh, really uh, invested a lot uh, in using active learning uh, to generate huge uh, a number of, of, of database. So it's basically this now extended to um, up to 72 elements uh, with uh, no uh, preconceived bias uh, in, in the chemistry. So uh, just to show you uh, what uh, this potential uh, can do uh, in this nature communication paper, uh, it shows four uh, examples. Uh, the first example is uh, lithium cation diffusion in, uh, a lithium, uh, in a lithium ion battery material. This is a cathode active material. Uh, pretty complex, right? It's a, a five element system. Uh, the second problem is molecular absorption. For example, water absorption in a variety of metal organic frameworks where you have organic ligands, uh, pretty complex uh, aromatic ligands uh, with uh, uh, metal cores. So uh, this, um, for example, MOF 74 structure. Uh, the third problem is a metallurgical problem uh, is a chemical order to disorder transition in copper gold alloys. And then the fourth problem is uh, fischer tropsch synthesis on top of this multi-metallic catalyst where you take hydrogen and carbon monoxide and you try to make hydrocarbon molecules. And so individually, each of this problem, uh, you know, by my previous experience, traditionally, you know, five years ago, deserved its own uh, empirical potential and you, you know, do the simulation, that's a paper. But the amazing thing about uh, PFP potential is it's all done with the same uh, empirical interatomic potential with a uniform uh, interface and, 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 and pretty much uniform accuracy. And just to sort of uh, show how fast uh, this potential is, uh, imagine, you know, you do 3000 uh, platinum atoms. Now that's not really, uh, you know, from a material science point of view, extraordinary uh, large system. Uh, if it's a nanoparticle, this is just like 10 nanometer nanoparticle. And, you know, if you want to have any kind of curve dislocations or, uh, or, or grain boundaries, then this is barely enough. So previously, DFT was not able to simulate 3,000 atoms because it's going, to sit, it's going to take more than a century of DFT calculations. But now uh, we can uh, do the impure potential simulation with just an hour. So something that, you know, you just take a coffee uh, and, and you come back, it's done, uh, you know, would take uh, a whole lifetime uh, with traditional DFT calculation. So the point is that uh, PFP can reach to much longer times and much larger number of atoms. So uh, there has been uh, rapid uh, updates uh, on this uh, PFP potential. So now it's already version four and uh, the niche communication paper covered 45 elements, but now uh, we already cover uh, 72 elements. And just want to give you a sense of the uh, amount of computation involved. Uh, to generate the data, uh, the DFT data, it took 1,144 GPU years, okay? 
not GPU days, it's GPU years, or in other words, uh, it's GPU millennia to generate the uh, DFT calculation. And these were driven by this active learning, which balances uh, uncertainty reduction, uh, which is uh, uh, exploration with uh, export, uh, exploitation. And totally, there are more than 22 million uh, DFT configurations to uh, fit uh, this uh, database, uh, to fit this uh, 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 PFP uh, potential. And <clears throat> here are some comparison with uh, leading uh, new network potentials. And generally uh, for disorder structures, uh, liquids, uh, uh, amorphous structures, uh, the error is typically below 30 MeV per, per atom, although I would say that it could be much, much better than that. 13.6 uh, uh, MeV per atom in this uh, data set. And then for crystalline structures, it's uh, typically uh, below uh, 10 MeV per atom. So this is, again, way less than the uh, thermal chemical measurements, the so-called chemical accuracy that quantum chemical people use to compare uh, with. So uh, what we can do uh, with uh, a code that can deal with uh, 20,000 atoms uh, in, in that now uh, the door is open to studying realistic uh, extended defects. For example, curved dislocations, curved cracks, uh, grain boundaries, phase boundaries in uh, atomistic simulations with DFT level accuracy. Uh, we can study dislocation, dislocation junctions, how to break these junctions. We can study dislocation interface interactions. Uh, this initial twin boundary picture I showed you. Realistic uh, heterogeneous uh, phase transformations where you have uh, nucleation on grain boundaries, on dislocations, uh, <clears throat> damage evolution, uh, stress corrosion cracking. You can have combined chemical reaction and uh, mechanical deformation, electrochemical interfaces, and so forth. And also uh, the potential uh, is uh, you can do the back propagation and you can do, uh, uh, you know, this could be a problem for a lot of uh, new network potential because it tend to be kind of noisy, but uh, with the PFP, uh, the phononic properties has been validated. You can get very good phonon dispersion, including nonlinear phonon scattering, so phonon language and the thermal conductivity predictions. And now uh, preferred network is also working on coupling the uh, environment dependent, uh, you know, the new network to electronic structure. So we can get uh, actually the electronic density and, and the, the uh, Hamiltonian to get actually electronic transport and things like thermal electric or even superconducting properties. So this is uh, under development, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's coming up. So next, I'm going to uh, show you uh, some applications that we have used uh, with uh, this potential. So the first example is <clears throat> a battery example. Um, so this is actually uh, published in Advanced Materials this year. Uh, it's a combined experimental computational work. So um, in a zinc metal battery, uh, a key problem is you have hydrogen uh, that also evolves because when you contact water with zinc, uh, you could actually uh, generate hydrogen gas, which is very dangerous. Uh, what uh, these co-authors have done is uh, instead of uh, zinc sulfate, uh, they have come up with this uh, <clears throat> zinc uh, benzene sulfonyl benzene sulfonamide, so-called a BBI uh, anion. And so this anion is very interesting. So it has this uh, aromatic hydrophobic uh, ends, but in the middle, you have a charged hydrophilic group. So it's an amphiphile, it's an amphiphilic anion. And so uh, when we, uh, you know, everything is else is the same, the same castle, the same anode, the same salt concentration, just replace sulfate with this uh, uh, amphiphil amphiphilic anion, we get much, much uh, more uh, stable cycling. Uh, so this is the uh, Coulombic efficiency of the uh, zinc metal uh, anode. And this is the uh, capacity of the, uh, of the full cell. And so the hypothesis 
uh, is that something must be going on uh, either in the bulk or at the interface. So what uh, the preferred network potential uh, using the Metalantis simulator is able to show is that between the water, so this is liquid water and the zinc metal, uh, we actually form uh, this uh, molecular layer, which is similar to so-called a solid electrolyte. And, and the function of this layer, which is just two uh, molecular uh, width wide, is it uh, forbids water to cross because if water cross, it would uh, actually become reduced and generate hydrogen gas. Uh, it forbids electrons uh, to tunnel through as well as proton uh, to move across this uh, solid electrolyte. However, uh, this solid electrolyte, as uh, Qingjie's uh, simulation shows, uh, is able to conduct a zinc uh, cation. So in, in essence, you have a zinc cation conducting solid electrolyte layer, which is, uh, have, uh, which is uh, prevents water and, and proton to cross and also prevent electron from going that way. So this really reveals uh, the mechanism of why uh, uh, this, uh, uh, BBI anion uh, uh, amphifel is, is, is great uh, in uh, prolonging uh, the cycle life of, of this thing's metal battery, which could be used for a uh, grid scale and energy storage. Uh, and then uh, we also have some work in progress not yet uh, published. So my uh, grad student, uh, Peyton Brown, is using uh, Matlantis to do uh, crystal structure predictions, basically compute the zero temperature uh, phase diagrams. So we're using this uh, WUSPEC algorithm, but with uh, our own modifications where we take an initial population of crystal structures, and then we use a genetic algorithm to hybridize and then uh, put strain on them and then use uh, the PFP potential to do uh, local energy optimization and then take the lower energy ones to refresh the population and then uh, to uh, uh, continue this process. So just as a sort of a sanity check, we start with uh, known crystals. So uh, we actually start with a simple cubic structures for carbon. I mean, that's of course ridiculous, but using uh, the PFP plus uh, the crystal structure search, we can get quickly the diamond structure for carbon, as well as the SP2 uh, graphene uh, graphite structure for, for diamond, uh, for, for, for carbon. So if we start uh, from simple cubic for silicon, we can get diamond cubic silicon. We start from simple cubic iron, we get a body center cubic iron. We start from some simple, uh, I think, diamond cubic uh, sodium chloride, we get the uh, rock salt uh, sodium chloride. And then we also checked, for example, a more complex structure like this uh, tantalum oxynitride, I can give uh, good structures. Then uh, we start to try to break uh, the known uh, thermodynamic convex hull, uh, free energy convex hull, uh, zero temperature still of uh, material project structures. So uh, material project is an invaluable tool. I use it uh, every day, uh, but what it, it is, you know, it, it gives you, uh, let's say for binary system, uh, the, uh, the convex hull structures, uh, but because materials project use DFT, some of the more complex crystals uh, are, are not covered. And therefore we're thinking, can we use the PFP to search for low energy structure? Then initially we just fixed composition and we just, just use this pi crystal generate random crystal structures to see if we can find structures which uh, breaks the convex hull starting from the material project structures. But then once we identify a new crystal structure, we would verify with VASP. Uh, so we're going to do a full uh, DFT calculation and then compare with the DFT convex hulls. And so indeed we're able to find new structures which were not included uh, in the material project. So uh, in material project, there is a three to one uh, lithium nitride intermetallic, uh, but uh, but, but if we take this initial structure and use the PFP, we're actually able to get a cubic structure. 
And uh, when we verified it with DFT, indeed it is lower uh, than this uh, material project structure. And later uh, we uh, generalize this uh, to uh, no longer fixed compositions. So, so generally we have three situations. So this uh, uh, red circle is on the hall. In other words, we start with something that materials project included in the database. And after genetic algorithm, we didn't find anything that's better than it. So that's called on hall. But sometimes uh, uh, we find uh, these which break the hall, uh, these green uh, crosses. So, uh, so in other words, uh, if I take the materials project structure, the, the blue solid line was the original uh, DFT GGA uh, convex hull. And then the orange line is what uh, PFP gives for calcium phosphide. Uh, but then when we run the uh, USPEX, we're able to break the hull. And then when we take these structures, some of these indeed break uh, the DFT hull. And by the way, uh, I want to say that uh, we are not fitting to this particular version of the functional. So uh, the error here uh, is not actually our fitting error uh, in developing the PFP. So generally we have this kind of breakdowns. Uh, when we run the PFP, uh, uh, we have on hall uh, below the hall, which uh, is verified by GG or even above the hall. Uh, in other words, PFP says it's actually metastable even though material project says uh, it is on the hall, but, but we have a very high discovery rate. We have a 40% accuracy. So seeing that we say is below the hall is actually below the hall in GGA. And with three hours, we can generate 800 structures. So this is a really a powerful tool for generating uh, new crystals and search for uh, uh, discovering new uh, crystal structures. So uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Qin Jie Li, who was my long-term collaborator, and he was uh, instrumental in developing the initial neural network experience uh, with Harvard University, with the Professor Kaxiris group, as well as in applying uh, the universal empirical potential for a whole range of applications. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Qin Jie to join. Thank you so much, Professor Li. And also, I would like to thank PFCC for this opportunity. Uh, so I think I, I will just add on a few of my personal experience in using uh, Metalantis platform. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Full screen, if you could make it. Um, yeah, great. Great. Yeah. OK. So I think this uh, neural network interatomic potential uh, is a rapidly developing uh, field. So if I just looking back, I will see a clear trajectory and also a few uh, transitions, actually, in my application scenario and also the associated uh, uh, frameworks. So, which is rare actually, I think, for, for conventional field, but in this rapidly developing field, actually uh, it's, uh, it's re really, really amazing, I think. So I will probably just uh, start from some of my er early work. And also I consider probably I'm also an early user of Metalantis platform in the uh, US. So I can just provide uh, some personal experience and feelings or opinions uh, and hope uh, and hope that's uh, helpful for new users or uh, other uh, researchers. So uh, okay. So I think yeah. I uh, back a few years ago. I think I just started with this better per nano framework. Uh, as Professor Lee already uh, uh, introduced in detail. So basically, we just decompose the total energy into atomic contribution, which can be further modeled with neural network for each species, depending on a local atomic environment. Um, so usually we have to you know, use some empirical descriptors to identify or differentiate different local atomic environments. 
Uh, some typical examples are symmetry functions uh, that's originally uh, proposed in this BP framework. So we have to come up with these uh, empirical descriptors. Uh, and also you can see there are some um, parameters involved in these symmetry functions, which is largely uh, based on your domain knowledge of the underlying materials and also uh, based on your previous research experience. So basically the, uh, the descriptors is uh, handcrafted. Uh, it's quite uh, empirical. And uh, finally, based on the symmetry functions, you can form a descriptor, it's, which is a vector you can see here for both uh, the pairwise interaction and also three body interactions. Um, so actually there are some issues associated with this uh, framework. Uh, for example, first of all, you have to consider symmetries. Actually in this scenario, it's invariant symmetry because we only considered the bound length or bound angle uh, so which is invariant to rotation translation, but also you have to satisfy the permutation uh, symmetry. All these uh, symmetry considerations have to be ful uh, fulfilled during the uh, development of descriptors. But also, as I mentioned, that you have to empirically choose the symmetry functions and the associated parameters you are using. And last, I think there's a more significant uh, issue is that you can see here, we only have like uh, two species. We, we already have a very long actually uh, uh, descriptor vector for the local, uh, 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 local atomic environment. If you have more species, you can imagine that this vector can increase rapidly. So that's not desired. So that's our initial try for this system and using this BP framework. And uh, next we, uh, made a transition to the so-called end-to-end learning frameworks, which actually can learn uh, the representation of atom uh, local atomic environments uh, without any em uh, empirical input. So to do this, we usually use like uh, uh, the so-called uh, graph neural network, which actually takes in, and takes in a graph and outputs also a graph, but with the node and the bound states updated. Uh, one popular way to update the states or uh, information of the node and bound is to use the so-called message passing. So that's one way. Another way uh, we also tried is uh, based on a local uh, coordinate uh, framework. So basically you have this relative uh, uh, atomic positions if you are considering a uh, central atom I. So you can have these uh, angular uh, information and also the radio information based on this local uh, local coordinate framework. Uh, framework. You can uh, further embed this information into neural network and uh, learn to map these uh, local representation to the atomic contribution to the total energy. So we tried both um, framework and we applied these end-to-end -end learning frameworks to a few materials uh, systems, for example, GST material, which is a phase change memory material, and also applied to uh, iron uh, hydrogen to study the hydrogen invertible uh, issue, and also applied it to high-entropy alloy system uh, to study the hydrogen effect on materials property. And also, we also uh, applied this to diamond, try to get, you know, uh, thermal properties of diamond. Uh, all of these are quite accurate, actually, I, I, would, I would like to say. But the problem is that it's not universal. Uh, that's a situation back to like uh, two years ago, I think. But now I think there are some improvements already occurred in this field. So for each uh, material system, you actually have to develop a, develop a new potential for them. So this, this is actually a quite a time consuming task because for each uh, potential may take like uh, weeks or even two months to perform the development task. So that's, uh, that's quite a big issue for us at that time. And then, uh, so actually developed this, uh, Tina or uh, Professor Lee already mentioned this. Actually, it's a, a graph neural network based, uh, based the potential. Uh, the, Novelty here is that for the uh, atomic and bound representation, it considers a scalar vector and a tensor so that 
the representation representation capability of the neural network is significantly increased, and also it is equivalent. So it seems like it's uh, quite capable of uh, modeling chemically complex system. So we just tried apply this uh, TNet framework to a chemically relatively chemically complex system uh, for this gold nanoparticle and the ligand interaction uh, scenarios. So we sampled uh, different uh, uh, configurations, including surfaces, bulk materials, nanoparticles, and uh, small molecules, and also random structures. And finally, we get a pretty good uh, potential for simulating surface, re uh, surface rearrangement of the nanoparticle. For example, here, there's a so-called staple motif that can actually rearrange the uh, surface atoms. And also we try to simulate how the nanoparticles dissociate at finite temperature. And uh, we discovered, uh, relative, uh, I think it's a new mechanism, how this nanoparticle is actually dissociated uh, due to the interaction between surface atom and the ligand molecules. And also we tried the interparticle interactions with this new potential. And I think all, the, all of these results are looking quite uh, promising, but still it takes uh, me a lot of time to develop this potential. And if you want to simulate a new systems, I think you have to add in more uh, training data. So I think just uh, like uh, last year, we, uh, we got this early access to try Metalantis, uh, which is capable of simulating like uh, 72 elements. So we use this platform to uh, try to, uh, uh, a quite a wide range of material system. So I very much like this uh, fit, uh, two features here. Uh, using Metalens, actually you can have access to both Jupyter Notebook development environment, and also we have the terminal, uh, terminal interface. So what I usually do is like uh, to develop my prototype code or method using this Jupyter notebook. Uh, there you can have, you can immediately have your, your results, right? And also you can visualize your system very well. And then after you finish this development work, you can move your code uh, uh, to a Python file, and then you can refactor them and uh, you can write a script, uh, scripts uh, to do some more efficient and uh, uh, background running uh, tasks in terminal. So this is my typical uh, workflow uh, using Metalantis here. So using this uh, platform, we actually did some uh, interesting work. So this battery materials application, uh, Professor Lee already mentioned here uh, in the previous slide. So I will not uh, talk about it in details. So I will move on to show some new result here. For example, here we studied a new electrolyte. Uh, this is a collaboration work with the uh, Linz group at uh, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So uh, we tried uh, Metalantis on this new electrolyte and we got a pretty good uh, agreement between uh, in, in mass density between experiment and also our MD simulation. And also we uh, try to analyze the local structure of the uh, cation. So we got a pretty good uh, agreement, I think, with the experiments. Uh, and also we use this uh, new potential to calculate the diffusivity, which I think can provide uh, quite good structural information into new materials. Uh, in addition to battery materials, we also applied uh, Metalantis to other material systems. For example, we tried uh, look into the vacancy ordering in this GST material, uh, which is known that uh, vacancy can have uh, ordering on 111 plane. Uh, but previously, people only did small DFT calculation. So you can only see like vacancy uh, ordering on parallel 111 planes. But here with much larger system, we start to see that vacancy start to form this uh, 3D network actually. So, which is uh, quite interesting to me. And also we try to uh, simulate this molten salt alloy interface and uh, by introducing some oxygen impurity into it and try to see how this uh, liquid phase and the impurity can 
modify how they can modify the surface uh, morphology of the alloy and how they can interact with the uh, metal atoms. So this is still ongoing work. And also we tried uh, on catalysis uh, process, like this is another particle consisting of uh, different uh, elements. And we, we were trying to see how this nanoparticle can uh, play a role in nucleating a molybdenum uh, disulfide 2D materials. Uh, yeah, we also try some uh, 2D materials here. This is a graphene two layer uh, uh, material. And uh, we try to see how the uh, defects and also dopants can affect the adsorption energy of some cations here. So according to my uh, experience, I think this, this is uh, in a pretty good agreement with the FT calculation. Uh, we also look into a complex uh, alloy system. For, for example, here, uh, we calculated the hydrogen interstitial formation energies in this uh, high entropy alloy. And we also show that this full sleep and uh, partial sleep activity can actually have some different effects on the formation energy distribution here. Uh, specifically, we show that the partial sleep can actually lead uh, to a octahedral to a tetrahedral side transformation of oxygen interstitial so that you can have a, a different bimodal distribution of the formation energy if you consider partial sleep. So finally, I want to highlight one example that uh, since Metalantis, uh, especially PFP uh, potential, Actually, it's a very accurate. It's a, you can consider it's a very close to DFT accuracy, but still there's a limitation that we cannot simulate a, a too large system. For example, you can probably cannot go beyond 10k atoms or 30k atoms at most. I think currently. So, if you are interested in simulating larger system with many defects such as dislocations, green boundaries then you have to uh, use a bigger system. So to deal with this problem, we actually tried this so-called QMMM method to extend the length scale. What we have done is uh, we simulate or treat uh, atoms around the defect core using uh, PFP on Metalantis. And we also fit another EM potential uh, with PFP uh, property as target. Uh, and uh, describe all the atoms outside the score with this EN potential. So finally, with both like uh, force mixing or energy mixing scheme, uh, we can model this uh, system up to uh, 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 maybe 10, 10 uh, 100 K atoms actually. So if you run this uh, whole system using pure PF PFP, uh, I think you will get an error, but uh, if we run this with this hybrid system uh, approach, we can definitely uh, smoothly get the result we want without any error. So I think that's pretty much I want to share with everyone. Yeah, so I will give this back to Professor Lee and um, we'll be very happy to answer any questions associated with it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Okay, I think I see uh, three questions uh, on the chat. Oh, um, Professor Lee, uh, could, could uh, Daisuke Okanahara have a few remarks just to conclude the lecture and we move on to the Q&A session? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Very ex exciting lecture. Thank you, Professor Lee and uh, Jinji Lee, uh, Dr. Jinji Lee, and uh, yeah, it includes the history from a Newton to the forefront of the material science research. And also I would mention that uh, if you would like to uh, learn more about the Matrantis, uh, please visit the website uh, matrantis.com where you can read research papers about the technologies as well as uh, case studies and the testimonials. And also, of course, if you would like to try using Matrantis, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us through the Matrantis website. Thank you. All right, thank you, Daisuke. Um, I would like to, now I would like to move on to the Q&A session. 
Um, again, uh, if you have any questions, um, please click the Q&A button uh, on your Zoom screen and submit them. You can make them anonymous and other attendees cannot see uh, your name or content of your questions at first um, until they're selected. Uh, now, here's the first uh, question I would like to say. Um, would it be possible to use the potential to study elect electron properties such as a uh, band gap or DOS? I guess this is for uh, Professor Lee. Yes. Uh, in fact, that's already uh, been done uh, uh, internally uh, in PFCC. So uh, once we have the uh, charge density, uh, then you can map to uh, electronic Hamiltonian and the wave function, uh, for example, using Vanier basis. And therefore, uh, this, this methodology of, of using tensors, I mean, it's originally developed based on the LCAO picture. So the whole philosophy is, uh, is rooted in electronic structure iteration. And so indeed it is, uh, it is uh, possible, but it's just not released at this point. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, still in the research phase and uh, we now confirm the result and also try to understand uh, what is uh, uh, remaining uh, problems and uh, try to uh, solve the, these problems one by one. So for example, uh, one successful uh, use was looking at the uh, density state, uh, electronic density state of amorphous silicon. So I have seen the results, it's, it's really pretty amazing. So there's a lot to be, uh, expected in the future. Okay, thank you, Professor Lee and Daisuke. Uh, let me read out the second questions that we got. Um, it is of great interest to hear that even the description of superconducting properties is in progress. Would metal insulator transitions also fall into uh, the scope of the description uh, within PFP, the potential, by any chance? Yeah, so this is uh, so the phononic property is already well reproduced. And then to do the standard, let's say, high pressure uh, hydride material, you need an electron phonon coupling. And once we have the description of the electronic Hamiltonian and access to the wave functions, we can even think about computing the matrix elements in the linear response theory. So all those are in principle possible, but I think there's still quite a way of development to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's, okay, we have more questions coming in. Thank you very much for submitting your questions. Um, okay, so the next uh, question, let's see. Um, next question, compounds that break the com convex hull are checked relative to DFT simulations. Are they also checked relative to empirical chemical results? In other words, in what percentage of times in is the model overfitting to the inaccuracies of DFT versus generally discovering empirical, empirically useful elements? Professor Lee. Yeah, we are trying to compare with the ICSD crystal structure database. And um, I just want to say that it's not the job of uh, PFP to, you know, its job is to fit whatever database we give it to it. Uh, that being said, uh, I think we're fitting to, you know, more accurate CCSD uh, T uh, couple cluster results. So I think in the future, it will be more accurate in addition to precise. And also we are doing uh, experimental uh, validations as well. And, and for example, that lithium nitride uh, could indeed form in lithium metal batteries. And uh, we're trying to verify some of these directly uh, experimentally. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's just move on to the next question as long as long as the time allows. Uh, would it be possible to use the, oh, sorry. Um, let, let me scroll down, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee and the team. I'm just curious, is this uh, potential can be extended to the uh, actinide systems? Yes, absolutely. So uh, one of my first uh, requests uh, to PFE is, yeah, we need to go to the actinides. So I think it's, it's coming. Uh, I, I, I hope it's coming <laughs> for sure, because we do want to cover up to element 92 uh, to claim, you know, finally, it's the entire periodic table is covered. Thank you. 
Um, anyone from PFCC want to add anything? Can, can we move on? Um, okay. Um, let's see, next question. Um, how was Matlantis benchmarked for applications that's discussed during the talks? If the accuracy is not desired, is there a method to improve the accuracy of Matlantis? Great question. Accuracy obviously is desired, but uh, the issue is where do we get uh, the accurate uh, data set? Uh, so using high powered quantum chemical methods, we can get uh, smaller clusters, let's say less than 30 atoms. So one idea is to use data learning, which is uh, if we can understand if there's a systematic correction going from DFT to the, let's say the CCSD couple cluster methods, then maybe we can use a transfer learning to improve the accuracy. Thank you. But I just want to emphasize that being able to get DFT level accuracy for 3000 atoms, 30,000 atoms will be a tremendous uh, boost to material science uh, and engineering. Because a lot of the you know, microstructure impacts properties, th this involves chemically complex uh, surfaces, microstructures. And previously, studying microstructure with DFT is pretty much impossible. Now we can study you know, this hydrogen dislocation interaction in complex alloys within a simulator, uh, just used uh, molecular dynamics. I, I, think, I think even just having the DFT level uh, is we will have a lot of new discoveries in the, in the next 10 years. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, let me move on to the next question. Uh, would you be interested in submitting the Mat Matlantis model to MatBench discovery? Thank you, that's um, a wonderful recommendation. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a daily user of materials project. So I, I hope someone at the PFP could actually do that. I, I would really appreciate uh, uploading. Yeah, anyone here. from PFCC, um, any comments? I think uh, it has to involve some PFCC decision about this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, any any uh, comments, uh, Daisuke, if you have any? Uh, I, I think the question is about uh, submitting a Matlantis model to the Mato bench. I think. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can consider. Okay. So, Thank you. Uh, um, Sure. Uh, so I, I think that Takamoto-san also can answer, but uh, I think that uh, comparing the accuracy or numbers between the model is uh, very challenging. And uh, we also found that uh, in many cases, uh, these benchmarks, uh, in these benchmarks, the uh, models overfit to the benchmark uh, data set. So yeah, I, we also released uh, some new benchmark data set. And uh, so we would like to compare the result in the such a very carefully designed data set. Otherwise, uh, yeah, most uh, machine learning models uh, tend to overfit to the, some specific data set. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just cover more questions, more and more questions. Thank you very much for submitting them. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, um, uh, next question, three questions. Hi, exciting work being done. I had some things in mind. Has Matlantis being tested for highly correlated systems like uh, lanthanides? Yes, so we have covered uh, gadolinium, uh, cerium, and uh, lanthanum. Uh, so I think uh, in the future, there'll be more rare earths covered. And uh, I think the, you know, uh, it has been tested, but but probably not as extensively as we would like. Thank you, Alan. Let me just read out the second question from uh, Ankita. The configurations mentioned to break the con convex hull, have they all been experimentally validated? Just trying to understanding understand the generali uh, generalizability in all aspects, Professor Lee? Not yet, not yet. So we're looking forward to actually doing that in a more high throughput fashion. Uh, but certainly that's a uh, searching for ICSD database and also doing new experiments to try to get uh, these uh, is, is very interesting to me personally. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, third question. Can you please repeat the slide on the breakdown of matrix elements about this? Uh, Professor Lee, would it be OK for us to share your um, um, your, your slides later with the participants? Oh, thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll be happy to. So, yeah, I, I can do that later. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess the matrix elements are, I guess, is this one? This is just uh, to illustrate tight binding. Uh, electronic Hamiltonian oh, yes. overlap matrix. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We still have about five minutes, so let me <laughs> read out as many questions as possible. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, next questions. Exciting presentations. How accurate are the PFPs? for systems that contain multiple types of defects, such as systems that contain both dislocations or gain uh, grain boundaries and solid liquid interfaces. Yeah, so we do see a systematic uh, higher error for disorder structures, probably because, you know, uh, in the database, there's a lot of random configurations, random chemistry. We're, we're, we're trying to have as little preconceived bias as possible, but, but still, because the random structures is, you know, in phase space is a bit bigger than ordered structures, the error is, uh, I would say, about three times larger than the crystalline structures. And because grain boundaries and the dislocation cores and the solid liquid interfaces all contain certain degrees of disorder, I would say the, the error there is, is, is somewhat higher than uh, perfect crystalline properties. But it's, it's very well bounded and much less, I would say, below the one kcal per mole error bound. Thank you. Um, so the time is coming up soon, so I would like to read out uh, two or three more questions. Um, next question, sorry, uh, next question. Uh, how long, uh, hold on, I mean, uh, how long does it need approximately to simulate a system with 10,000 atoms using PFP potential using one CPU node? I think this is- Yeah, the, I think just to say that uh, everything is based on GPU, and it's a software as a service. So uh, I, I want uh, Daisuke san to, to answer this question. Yeah, th thank you. I, I think this is a PFCC <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yes. Yeah, we do not uh, optimize the model for the CPU. Uh, so maybe I think, but uh, I think the 100 times more time or more to yeah, compute the PFP in CPU. So maybe the uh, several minutes or more, maybe. <laughs> but okay. uh, yeah, okay. yeah, there are many uh, accelerator also in the CPU. If we can utilize this, uh, we can uh, have a better result. But the uh, current but, but, model is, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just want to add that uh, like any impure potential, uh, it, it is order N. So, uh, with with more GPUs and, and more resources, we can simulate. So in terms of both number of atoms and at the time, it's it's linear. Yeah. Unlike DFT, which is at least uh, n cubed. Thank you. Uh, let me read out the next question. Amazing work. Do you plan to develop a module for hybrid Matlantis RMC simulations? Anyone? Yes, and that's actually very easy uh, in the uh, Jupyter notebook. So uh, to do you know, this energetic with reverse Monte Carlo, try to fit to experimental uh, pair distribution functions. So a lot of those I think will be offered in the ecosystem. So we have already been developing little subroutines that we can share with the community. Hmm. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, let me read out more questions. In terms of test error versus computational cost, MTP, seems to be to, to perform better than NNP. Any drawbacks of MTP? Do you think there's possibility of MTP to become, become dominant in the future? Uh, I just want to say MTP the, in that chart is only for unary and binary systems. It does not have the capability to do the whole periodic table. So I think even though neural network was not on the Pareto front in the computational cost versus accuracy for very simple crystals, but I do believe that uh, in order to represent the rich chemistry we have in this world. Uh, we need the new network potentials. Thank you. 
Just one more question in this last minute. Um, how many types of atoms can be handled in a single system? This will be the last question. 72 um, types of elements. Uh, yeah, 72 elements. Thank you. Okay, so the time is up. There's no constriction. There's no restriction on how many atoms of this type, how many atoms are. You can put any atoms as long as it's on the PRC table into the simulator. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is that accurate? Uh, is that any anything to add, PFCC, though? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee Daisuke, and all of you who have, uh, uh, and Tinjie too, all of you who have uh, submitted your questions. Uh, so I'd like to conclude the Q&A session and the webinar. Um, again, we would be grateful if you could respond to the questionnaire that we're sharing in the Zoom chat. Can, Rabi-san, can you share the, the questionnaire? Which we'll send you by email too. Um, we plan to hold more webinars in the future, and your feedback this time will be greatly appreciated so we can better our offerings. Uh, we will send you updates by email in the future going forward and hope you will find them useful. Um, again, if you're interested in Atlantis, please visit atlantis.com and feel free to send us any inquiries. Um, thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.